Part three, chapter two of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three, a voyage to Laputa, Balnababi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter Two, the humours and dispositions of the Laputians described, an account of their learning, of the king and his court, the author's reception there, the inhabitants subject to fear and disquietudes, an account of the women. At my alighting, I was surrounded with a crowd of people, but those who stood nearest seemed to be of better quality. They beheld me with all the marks and circumstances of wonder. Neither, indeed, was I much in their debt, having never till then seen a race of mortals so singular in their shapes, habits, and countenances. Their heads were all reclined, either to the right or the left, one of their eyes turned inward, and the other directly up to the zenith. Their outward garments were adorned with the figures of suns, moons, and stars, interwoven with those of fiddles, flutes, harps, trumpets, guitars, harpsichords, and many other musical instruments, unknown to us in Europe. I observed, here and there, many in the habit of servants, with a brown bladder, fastened like a flail to the end of a stick, which they carried in their hands. In each bladder was a small quantity of dried peas, or little pebbles, as I was afterwards informed. With these bladders, they now and then flapped the mouths and ears of those who stood near them, of which practice I could not then conceive the meaning. It seems the mind of these people are so taken up with the intense speculations that they can neither speak nor attend to the discourses of others without being roused by some external taction upon the organs of speech and hearing, for which reason those persons who are able to afford it always keep a flapper, the original is Klimnol, in their family, as one of their domestics. Nor ever walk abroad, or make visits without him. And the business of this officer is, when two, three, or more persons are in company, gently to strike with his bladder the mouth of him who is to speak, and the right ear of him, or them, to whom the speaker addresses himself. This flapper is likewise employed diligently, to attend his master in his walks, and, upon occasion, to give him a soft flap on his eyes, because he is always so wrapped up in cogitation, that he is in manifest danger of falling down every precipice, and bouncing his head against every post, and in the streets, of jostling others, or being jostled himself into the kennel. It was necessary to give the reader this information, without which he would be at the same loss with me to understand the proceedings of these people. As they conducted me up the stairs to the top of the island, and from thence to the royal palace. While we were ascending, they forgot several times what they were about, and left me to myself, till their memories were again roused by their flappers, for they appeared altogether unmoved by the sight of my foreign habit and countenance and by the shouts of the vulgar, whose thoughts and minds were more disengaged. At last we entered the palace, and proceeded into the chamber of presence, where I saw the king seated on his throne, attended on each side by persons of prime quality. Before the throne was a large table filled with globes and spheres, and mathematical instruments of all kinds. His majesty took not the least notice of us, although our entrance was not without sufficient noise, by the concourse of all persons belonging to the court. But he was then deep in a problem, and we attended at least an hour before he could solve it. There stood by him, on each side, a young page with flaps in their hands, and when they saw he was at leisure, one of them gently struck his mouth, and the other his right ear at which he started like one awaked on the sudden, 
and looking towards me and the company I was in, recollect the occasion of our coming, whereof he had been informed before. He spoke some words, whereupon immediately a young man with a flap came up to my side, and flapped me gently on the right ear. But I made signs, as well as I could, that I had no occasion for such an instrument, which, as I afterwards found, gave His Majesty and the whole court a very mean opinion of my understanding. The King, as far as I could conjecture, asked me several questions, and I addressed myself to him in all the languages I had. When it was found I could neither understand nor be understood, I was conducted by his order to an apartment in his palace. This prince being distinguished above all his predecessors for his hospitality to strangers, where two servants were appointed to attend me. My dinner was brought, and four persons of quality, whom I remember to have seen very near the king's person, did me the honour to dine with me. We had two courses of three dishes each. In the first course there was a shoulder of mutton cut into an equilateral triangle, a piece of beef into a rhomboides, and a pudding into a cycloid. The second course was two ducks, trussed up in the form of fiddles, sausages and puddings resembling flutes and hoboys, and a breast of veal in the shape of a harp. The servants cut our bread into cones, cylinders, parallelograms, and several other mathematical figures. After dinner my company withdrew, and a person was sent to me by the king's order, attended by a flapper. He brought with him pen, ink, and paper, and three or four books, giving me to understand by signs that he was sent to teach me the language. We sat together four hours, in which time I wrote down a great number of words in columns, with the translations over against them. I likewise made a shift to learn several short sentences, for my tutor would order one of my servants to fetch something, to turn about, to make a bow, to sit, or to stand, or walk, and the like. Then I took down the sentence in writing. He showed me also, in one of his books, the figures of the sun, moon, and stars, the zodiac, the tropics, and polar circles, together with the denominations of many planes and solids. He gave me the names and descriptions of all the musical instruments, and the general terms of art in playing on each of them. After he had left me, I placed all my words, with their interpretations, in alphabetical order. And thus, in a few days, by the help of a very faithful memory, I got some insight into their language. The word, which I interpret the flying or floating island, is in the original Laputa, whereof I could never learn the true entomology. Lap, in the old obsolete language, signifies high, and Umta, a governor, from which they say, by corruption, was derived Laputa, from Lapunta. But I do not approve of this derivation, which seems to be a little strained. I ventured to offer to the learned among them a conjecture of my own, that Laputa was quasi lapouted, lap, signifying property, the dancing of the sunbeams in the sea, and outed, a wing, which, however, I shall not obtrude, but submit to the judicious reader. Those to whom the king had entrusted me, observing how ill I was clad, ordered a tailor to come next morning and take measure for a suit of clothes. The operator did his office after a different manner from those of his trade in Europe. He first took my altitude by a quadrant, and then, with a rule and a compass, described the dimensions and outlines of my whole body, all which he entered upon paper, and in six days brought me clothes very ill-made and quite out of shape by happening to mistake a figure in the calculation. But my comfort was, that I observed such accidents very frequent, and little regarded. 
during my confinement for want of clothes, and by an indisposition that held me some days longer, I much enlarged my dictionary, and when I went next to court, was able to understand many things the king spoke, and to return him some kind of answers. His Majesty had given orders that the island should move northeast and by east, to a vertical point over Lagado, the metropolis of the whole kingdom below, upon the firm earth. It was about ninety leagues distant, and our voyage lasted four days and a half. I was not in the least sensible of the progressive motion in the air by the island. On the second morning, about eleven o'clock, the king, himself in person, attended by his nobility, courtiers, and officers, having prepared all their musical instrument, played on them for three hours, without intermission, so that I was quite stunned with the noise. Neither could I possibly guess the meaning, till my tutor informed me. He said that the people of their island had their ears adapted to hear the music of the spheres, which always played at certain periods, and the court was now prepared to bear their part in whatever instrument they most excelled. In our journey towards Lagado, the capital city, His Majesty ordered that the island should stop over certain towns and villages, from whence he might receive the petitions of his subjects. And to this purpose, several pack-threads were let down, with small weights at the bottom. On these pack-threads the people strung their petitions, which mounted up directly, like the scraps of paper fastened by schoolboys at the end of the string that holds their kite. Sometimes we received wines and victuals from below, which were drawn up by pulleys. The knowledge I had in mathematics gave me great assistance in acquiring their phraseology, which depended much upon that science and music, and in the latter I was not unskilled. Their ideas are perpetually conservant in lines and figures. If they would, for example, praise the beauty of a woman, or any other animal, they described it by rhombus, circles, parallelograms, ellipses, and other geometric terms, or by words of art drawn from music. Needless here to repeat. I observed in the king's kitchen all sorts of mathematical and musical instruments, after the figures of which they cut up the joints that were served to his majesty's table. Their houses are very ill-built, the walls bevel, without one right angle in any apartment, and this defect arises from the contempt they bear to practical geometry, which they despise as vulgar and mechanic. Those instructions they give being too refined for the intellects of their workmen, which occasions perpetual mistakes, and although they are dexterous enough upon a piece of paper, in the management of the rule, the pencil, and the divider. Yet, in the common actions and behaviour of life, I have not seen a more clumsy, awkward, and unhandy people, nor so slow and perplexed in their conceptions upon all other subjects, except those of mathematics and music. They are very bad reasoners, and vehemently given to opposition, unless, when they happen to be of the right opinion, which is seldom their case. Imagination, fancy, and invention, they are wholly strangers to, nor have any words in their language, by which these ideas can be expressed, the whole compass of their thoughts and minds being shut up within the two forementioned sciences. Most of them, and especially those who deal in the astronomical part, have great faith in judicial astrology, although they are ashamed to own it publicly. But what I chiefly admire and thought altogether unaccountable, was the strong disposition I observed in them towards news and politics, perpetually inquiring into public affairs, giving their judgments in matters of state, and passionately disputing every inch of a party opinion. I have indeed observed the same disposition among most of the mathematicians I have known in Europe, although I could never discover the least analogy between the two sciences unless those people suppose that because the smallest circle has as many degrees as the largest, 
Therefore, the regulation and management of the world require no more abilities than the handling and turning of a globe. But I rather take this quality to spring from a very common infirmity of human nature, inclining us to be most curious and conceited in manners where we have least concern, and from which we are least adapted by study or nature. These people are under continual disquietudes, never enjoying a minute's peace of mind, and their disturbances proceed from causes which very little affect the rest of mortals. Their apprehensions arise from several changes they dread in the celestial bodies. For instance, that the earth, by the continual approaches of the sun towards it, must, in course of time, be absorbed or swallowed up, that the face of the sun will, by degrees, be encrusted with its own effluvia, and give no more light to the world. That the earth very narrowly escaped a brush from the tail of the last comet, which would have infallibly reduced it to ashes, and that the next, which they have calculated for one and thirty years hence, will probably destroy us. For if, in its prehelion, it should approach within a certain degree of the sun, as by their calculations they have reason to dread, it will receive a degree of heat ten thousand times more intense than that of a red, hot, glowing iron, and, in its absence from the sun, carry a blazing tail ten hundred thousand and fourteen miles long, through which, if the earth should pass at a distance of one hundred miles from the nucleus, or the main body of the comet, it must, in its passage, be set on fire, and reduced to ashes, that the sun, daily spending its rays without any nutriment to supply them, will at last be wholly consumed and annihilated, which must be attended with the destruction of this earth, and of all the planets that receive their light from it. They are so perpetually alarmed with the apprehensions of these, and the like impending dangers, that they can neither sleep quietly in their beds, nor have any relish for the common pleasures and amusements of life. When they meet an acquaintance in the morning, the first question is about the sun's health, how he looked at his setting and rising, and what hopes they have to avoid the stroke of the approaching comet. This conversation they are apt to run into with the same temper that boys discover in delighting to hear terrible stories of spirits and hobgoblins which they greedily listen to, and dare not go to bed for fear. The women of the island have abundance of vivacity. They contemn their husbands, and are exceedingly fond of strangers, whereof there is always a considerable number from the continent below, attending at court, either upon affairs of the several towns and corporations, or their own particular occasions, but are much despised, because they want the same endowments. Among these the ladies choose their gallants. But the vexation is, that they act with too much ease and security, for the husband is always so wrapped in speculation, that the mistress and lover may proceed to the greatest familiarities before his face, if he be but provided with paper and implements, and without his flapper at his side. The wives and daughters lament their confinement to the island, although I think it is the most delicious spot of ground in the world, and although they live here in the greatest plenty and magnificence, and are allowed to do whatever they please, they long to see the world, and take the diversions of the metropolis, which they are not allowed to do without a particular license from the king, and that is not easy to be obtained because the people of quality have found, by frequent experience, how hard it is to persuade their women to return from below. I was told that a great court lady, who had several children, is married to the Prime Minister, the richest subject in the kingdom, a very graceful person, extremely fond of her, and lives in the finest palace of the island. Went down to Lagado on the pretense of health, there hid herself for several months, till the king sent a warrant to search for her, and she was found in an obscure eating-house all in rags, having pawned her clothes to maintain an old, deformed footman, who beat her every day, 
and in whose company she was taken, much against her will. And although her husband received her with all possible kindness, and without the least reproach, she soon after contrived to steal down again, with all her jewels, to the same gallant, and has not been heard of since. This may perhaps pass with the reader, rather for a European or English story, than for one of a country so remote. But he may please to consider that the caprices of womankind are not limited by any climate or nation, and that they are much more uniform than can be easily imagined. In about a month's time, I had made a tolerable proficiency in their language, and was able to answer most of the king's questions, when I had the honour to attend him. His Majesty discovered not the least curiosity to inquire into the laws, government, history, religion, or manners of the countries where I had been, but confined his questions to the state of mathematics, and received the account I gave him with great contempt and indifference, though often roused by his flapper on each side. End of Part 3 Chapter 2 Part three, chapter three of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three A Voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. CHAPTER Three, A PHENOMENON SOLVED BY MODERN PHILOSOPHY AND ASTRONOMY, THE LAPUTIAN'S GREAT IMPROVEMENTS IN THE LATTER, THE KING'S METHOD OF SUPPRESSING INSURRECTIONS. I DESIRED LEAVE OF THIS PRINCE TO SEE THE CURIOSITIES OF THE ISLAND, WHICH HE WAS GRACIOUSLY PLEASED TO GRANT, AND ORDERED MY TUTOR TO ATTEND ME. I CHIEFLY WANTED TO KNOW, TO WHAT CAUSE, IN ART OR IN NATURE, it owed its several motions, whereof I will now give a philosophical account to the reader. The flying or floating island is exactly circular, its diameter 7,837 yards, or about four miles and a half, and consequently contains 10,000 acres. It is 300 yards thick. The bottom, or under surface, which appears to those who view it below, is one even regular plate of adamant, shooting up to the height of about two hundred yards. Above it lie the several minerals in their usual order, and over all is a coat of rich mould, ten or twelve feet deep. The declivity of the upper surface, from the circumference to the centre, is the natural cause why all the dews and rains, which fall upon the island, are conveyed in small rivulets towards the middle, where they are emptied into four large basins, each of about half a mile in circuit, and two hundred yards distant from the centre. From these basins the water is continually exhaled by the sun in the daytime, which effectually prevents their overflowing. Besides, as it is in the power of the monarch to raise the island above the rain of clouds and vapours, he can prevent the falling of dews and rain whenever he pleases for the highest clouds cannot rise above two miles, as naturalists agree. At least, they were never known to do so in that country. At the centre of the island, there is a chasm about fifty yards in diameter, whence the astronomers descend into a large dome, which is thereof called Flandona Gagnol, or the astronomer's cave, situated at the depth of a hundred yards beneath the upper surface of the adamant, in this cave are twenty lamps continually burning, which, from the reflection of the adamant, cast a strong light into every part. The place is stored with great variety of sextants, quadrants, telescopes, astrolabes, and other astronomical instruments. But the greatest curiosity, upon which the fate of the island depends, is a lodestone of a prodigious size, in shape resembling a weaver's shuttle. It is, in length, six yards, 
and in the thickest part at least three yards over. This magnet is sustained by a very strong axle of adamant, passing through its middle, upon which it plays, and is poised so exactly that the weakest hand can turn it. It is hooped round with a hollow cylinder of adamant, four feet yards in diameter, placed horizontally, and supported by eight adamantine feet, each six yards high. In the middle of the concave side, there is a groove twelve inches deep, in which the extremities of the axle are lodged, and turned round as there is occasion. The stone cannot be removed from its place by any force, because the hoop and its feet are one continued piece with that body of adamant, which constitutes the bottom of the island. By means of this lodestone, the island is made to rise and fall, and move from one place to another. For with respect to that part of the earth over which the monarch presides, the stone is endured at one side of its side with an attractive power, and at the other with a repulsive. Upon placing the magnet erect, with its attracting end towards the earth, the island descends. But when the repelling extremity points downwards, the island mounts directly upwards. When the position of the stone is oblique, the motion of the island is too. For in this magnet, the forces always act in lines parallel to its direction. By this oblique motion, the island is conveyed to different parts of the monarch's dominions. To explain the manner of its progress, let AB represent a line drawn across the dominions of Balnabarbi. Let the line CD represent the lodestone, of which D be the repelling end, and C the attracting end. The island being over capital C, let the stone be placed in position CD, with its repelling end downwards. Then the island will be driven upwards obliquely towards capital D. When it has arrived at capital D, let the stone be turned upon its axle, till the attracting end points towards E, and then the island will be carried obliquely towards E, where, if the stone being again turned upon its axle, till it stands in the position EF, with its repelling point downwards, the island will rise obliquely towards F, where, by directing the attracting end towards G, the island may be carried to G, and from G to H, by turning the stone, so as to make its repelling extremity to point directly downward. And thus, by changing the situation of the stone, as often as there is occasion, the island is made to rise and fall, by turns, in an oblique direction, and by those alternate risings and fallings, the obliquity being not considerable, is conveyed from one part of the dominions to the other. But it must be observed that this island cannot move beyond the extent of the dominions below, nor can it rise above the height of four miles, for which the astronomers, who have written large systems concerning the stone, assign the following reason, that the magnetic virtue does not extend beyond the distance of four miles, and that the mineral, which acts upon the stone in the bowels of the earth, and in the sea about six leagues distance from the shore, is not diffused through the whole globe, but terminated with the limits of the king's dominions. And it was easy, from the great advantage of such a superior situation, for a prince to bring under his obedience whatever country lay within the attraction of that magnet. When the stone is put parallel to the plane of the horizon, the island stands still, for in that case the extremities of it, being at equal distance from the earth, act with equal force, the one in drawing downwards, the other in pushing upwards, and consequently no motion can ensue. This lodestone is under the care of certain astronomers, who, from time to time, give it such positions as the monarch directs. They spend the greatest part of their lives in observing the celestial bodies, which they do by the assistance of glasses, far excelling ours in goodness. For, although their largest telescopes do not exceed three feet, they magnify much more than those of a hundred with us, 
and show the stars with greater clearness. This advantage has enabled them to extend their discoveries much further than our astronomers in Europe, for they have made a catalogue of ten thousand fixed stars, whereas the largest of ours do not contain above one-third part of that number. They have likewise discovered two lesser stars, or satellites, which revolve about Mars, whereof the innermost is distant from the centre of the primary planet exactly three of his diameters, and the outermost five. The former revolves in the space of ten hours, and the latter in twenty-one and a half, so that the squares of the periodical times are very near in the same proportion with the cubes of their distance from the centre of Mars, which evidently shows them to be governed by the same law of gravitation that influences the other heavenly bodies. They have observed ninety-three different comets, and settled their periods with great exactness. If this be true, and they affirm it with great confidence, it is much to be wished that their observations were made public, whereby the theory of comets, which at present is very lame and defective, might be brought to the same perfection with other arts of astronomy. The king would be the most absolute prince in the universe, if he could but prevail on a ministry to join with him. But these, having their estates below on the continent, and considering that the office of a favourite has a very uncertain tenure, would never consent to the enslaving of their country. If any town should engage in rebellion or mutiny, fall into violent factions, or refuse to pay the usual tribute, the king has two methods of reducing them to obedience. The first and mildest course is, by keeping the island hovering over such a town, and the lands about it, whereby he can deprive them of the benefit of the sun and the rain, and consequently afflict the inhabitants with dearth and disease. And if the crime deserve it, they are at the same time pelted from above with great stones, against which they have no defence, but by creeping into cellars or caves, while the roofs of their houses are beaten to pieces. But, if they still continue obstinate, or offer to raise insurrections, he proceeds to the last remedy, by letting the island drop directly upon their heads, which makes a universal destruction both of houses and men. However, this is an extremity to which the prince is seldom driven. Neither, indeed, is he willing to put it in execution, nor dare his ministers advise him to an action, which, as it would render them odious to the people, so it would be a great damage to their own estates, which all lie below, for the island is the king's domain. But there is still indeed a more weighty reason kings of this country have always been averse from executing so terrible an action, unless upon the utmost necessity. For if the town intended to be destroyed should have in it any tall rocks, as it generally falls out in the larger cities, a situation probably chosen at first with a view to prevent such a catastrophe, or if it abound in high spires or pillars of stone, a sudden fall might endanger the bottom or under surface of the island, which, although it consist, as I have said, of one entire adamant, two hundred yards thick, might happen to crack by too great a shock, or burst by approaching too near the fires from the houses below. As the backs, both of iron and stone, will often do in our chimneys. Of all this the people are well appraised, and understand how far to carry their obstinacy, where their liberty or property is concerned. And the king, when he is highest provoked, and most determined to press a city to rubbish, orders the island to descend with great gentleness, out of a pretense of tenderness to his people, but, indeed, for fear of breaking the adamantine bottom. In which case, it is the opinion of all the philosophers that the lodestone could no longer hold it up, and the whole mass would fall to the ground. By a fundamental law of this realm, neither the king nor either of his two eldest sons 
are permitted to leave the island, nor the queen, till she is past childbearing. End of part three, chapter three. Part three, chapter four of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three. A voyage to Laputa, Balnabarbi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter four. The author leaves Laputa, is conveyed to Balnabarbi, arrives at the metropolis. A description of the metropolis and the country adjoining. The author hospitably received by a great lord. His conversation with that lord. Although I cannot say that I was ill-treated in this island, yet I must confess I thought myself too much neglected, not without some degree of contempt, for neither prince nor people appeared to be curious in any part of knowledge, except mathematics and music, wherein I was far their inferior, and upon that account very little regarded. On the other side, after having seen all the curiosities of the island, I was very desirous to leave it, being heartily weary of those people. They were indeed excellent in two sciences for which I have great esteem, and wherein I am not unversed, but, at the same time, so abstracted and involved in speculation, that I have never met with such disagreeable companions. I conversed only with women, tradesmen, flappers, and court pages, during two months of my abode there by which, at least, I rendered myself extremely contemptible. Yet these were the only people from whom I could ever receive a reasonable answer. I had obtained, by hard study, a good degree of knowledge in their language. I was weary of being confined to an island where I received so little countenance, and resolved to leave it with the first opportunity. There was a great lord at court, nearly related to the king, and for that reason alone used with respect. He was universally reckoned the most ignorant and stupid person among them. He had performed many eminent services for the crown, had great natural and acquired parts, adorned with integrity and honour, but so ill an ear for music that his detractors reported he had been often known to beat time in the wrong place. Neither could his tutors, without extreme difficulty, teach him to demonstrate the most easy proposition in the mathematics. He was pleased to show me many marks of favour, often did me the honour of a visit, desired to be informed in the affairs of Europe, the laws and customs, the manners and learning of the several countries where I had travelled. He listened to me with great attention, and made very wise observations on all I spoke. He had two flappers attending him for state, but never made use of them, except at court and in visits of ceremony, and would always command them to withdraw when we were alone together. I entreated this illustrious person to intercede in my behalf with his majesty, for leave to depart, which he accordingly did, as he was pleased to tell me, with great regret, for indeed he had made me several offers very advantageous which, however, I refused, with expressions of the highest acknowledgment. On the 16th of February I took leave of His Majesty and the court. The king made me a present to the value of about two hundred pounds English, and my protector, his kinsman, as much more, together with a letter of recommendation to a friend of his in Lagado, the metropolis. The island being then hovering over a mountain about two miles from it, I was let down from the lowest gallery, in the same manner I had been taken up. The continent, as far as it is subject to the monarch of the flying island, passes under the general name of Balnabarbi, and the metropolis, as I have said before, is called Lagado. I felt some little satisfaction in finding myself on firm ground. I walked to the city without any concern, being clad like one of the natives, 
and sufficiently instructed to converse with them. I soon found out the person's house to whom I was recommended, presented my letter from his friend, the grandee in the island, and was received with much kindness. This great lord, whose name was Minodi, ordered me an apartment in his own house, where I continued during my stay, and was entertained in a most hospitable manner. The next morning after my arrival, he took me in his chariot to see the town, which is about half the bigness of London, but the house is very strangely built, and most of them out of repair. The people in the streets walked fast, looked wild, their eyes fixed, and were generally in rags. We passed through one of the town gates, and went about three miles into the country, where I saw many labourers working with several sorts of tools in the ground, but was not able to conjecture what they were about. Neither did observe any expectation either of corn or grass, although the soil appeared to be excellent. I could not forbear admiring at these odd appearances, both in town and country, and I made bold to desire my conductor that he would be pleased to explain to me what could be meant by so many busy heads, hands, and faces, both in the streets and the fields, because I did not discover any good effects they produced. But, on the contrary, I never knew a soil so unhappily cultivated, houses so ill-contrived and so ruinous, or a people whose countenances and habit expressed so much misery and want. This Lord Monodi was a person of the first rank, and had been some years governor of Lagado, but, by a cable of ministers, was discharged for insufficiency. However, the king treated him with tenderness, as a well-meaning man, but of a low, contemptible understanding. When I gave that free censure of the country and its inhabitants, he made no further answer than by telling me that I had not been long enough among them to form a judgment, and that the different nations of the world had different customs, with other common topics to the same purpose. But, when we returned to his palace, he asked me how I liked the building, what absurdities I observed, and what quarrel I had with the dress or look of his domestics. This he might safely do, because everything about him was magnificent, regular, and polite. I answered that his excellency's prudence, quality, and fortune had exempted him from those defects which folly and beggary had produced in others. He said, if I would go with him to his country house, about twenty miles distant, where his estate lay, there would be more leisure for this kind of conversation. I told his excellency that I was entirely at his disposal, and accordingly we set out next morning. During our journey he made me observe the several methods used by farmers in managing their lands, which, to me, were wholly unaccountable, for, except in some very few places, I could not discover one ear of corn or blade of grass. But in three hours' travelling the scene was wholly altered. We came into a most beautiful country, farmers' houses at small distances neatly built, the fields enclosed, containing vineyards, corn grounds, and meadows. Neither do I remember to have seen a more delightful prospect. His Excellency observed my countenance to cheer up. He told me, with a sigh, that there his estate began, and would continue the same, till we should come to his house, that his countrymen ridiculed and despised him for managing his affairs no better, and for setting so ill an example to the kingdom, which, however, was followed by very few, such as were old and willful and weak like himself. We came at length to the house, which was indeed a noble structure, built according to the best rules of ancient architecture. The fountains, gardens, walks, avenues, and groves were all disposed with exact judgment and taste. I gave due praises to everything I saw, whereof His Excellency took not the least notice till after supper, when, there being no third companion, he told me with a very melancholy air, that he doubted he must throw down his houses in town and country, to rebuild them after the present mode. 
destroy all his plantations, and cast others into such a form as modern usage required, and give the same directions to all his tenants, unless he would submit to incur the censure of pride, singularity, affectation, ignorance, caprice, and perhaps increase his majesty's displeasure, that the admiration I appeared to be under would cease or diminish, when he had informed me of some particulars which, probably, I had never heard of at court, the people there being too much taken up in their own speculations, to have regard to what passed here below. The sum of his discourse was to this effect, that about forty years ago certain persons went up to Laputa, either upon business or diversion, and, after five months' continuance, came back with a very little smattering in mathematics, but full of volatile spirits acquired in that airy region. That these persons, upon their return, began to dislike the management of everything below, and fell into schemes of putting all arts, sciences, languages, and mechanics upon a new foot. To this end they procured a royal patent for erecting an academy of projectors in Legado, and the humour prevailed so strongly among the people that there is not a town of any consequence in the kingdom without such an academy. In these colleges the professors contrive new rules and methods of agriculture and building, and new instruments and new tools for all trades and manufacturers, whereby, as they undertake, one man shall do the work of ten, a palace may be built in a week of materials so durable as to last for ever without repairing. All the fruits of the earth shall come to maturity at whatever season we think fit to choose, and increase a hundredfold more than they do at present, with innumerable other happy proposals. The only inconvenience is, that none of these projects are yet brought to perfection, and in the meantime the whole country lies miserably waste, the houses in ruin, and the people without food or clothes. By all which, instead of being discouraged, they are fifty times more violently bent upon prosecuting their schemes, driven equally on by hope and despair. But as for himself, being not of an enterprising spirit, he was content to go on in the old forms, to live in a house as his ancestors had built, and act as they did, in every part of life, without innovation. That some few other persons of quality and gentry had done the same, but were looked on with an eye of contempt and ill-will, as enemies to art, ignorant and ill-commonwealth's men, preferring their own ease and sloth before the general improvement of their country. His lordship added, that he would not, by any further particulars, prevent the pleasure I should certainly take in viewing the Grand Academy, whether he was resolved I should go. He only desired me to observe a ruined building upon the side of a mountain about three miles distant, of which he gave me this account. There had been a very convenient mill within half a mile of his house, turned by a current from a large river, and sufficient for his own family, as well as a great number of his tenants. That about seven years ago, a club of those projectors came to him with proposals to destroy this mill, and build another on the side of that mountain, on the long ridge whereof a long canal must be cut, for a repository of water, to be conveyed up by pipes and engines to supply the mill, because the wind and air upon a height agitated the water, and thereby made it fitter for motion, and because the water descending down a declivity would turn the mill with half the current of a river, whose course is more upon a level. He said, that being then not very well with the court, and pressed by many of his friends, he complied with the proposal, and after employing a hundred men for two years, the work miscarried, the projectors went off, laying the blame entirely upon him, railing at him ever since, and putting others upon the same experiment, with equal assurance of success, as well as equal disappointment. In a few days we came back to town, and His Excellency, considering the bad character he had in the academy, would not go with me himself, but recommended me to a friend of his, to bear me company thither. My lord was pleased to represent me as a great admirer of projects, and a person of much curiosity and easy belief, 
which indeed was not without truth, for I had myself been a sort of projector in my younger days. End of part three, chapter four.